Straight Now tuned in to the show. You learn the discipline to show up day after day to do the work, the confidence to put yourself out there, boldly and authentically, and the mental toughness to continue showing up, doing the work, putting yourself out there, even when the success you expect to achieve is yet to be achieved. And on top of all this, you get a huge dose of personal initiative. What is that? That is a go-getter energy that moves any one of us, including yourself, to go and make things happen instead of wait for things to happen. And then we put all this together into a series of frameworks, approaches, insights, strategies, techniques, philosophies, one unifying philosophy that is called, and a bunch of books, and you got this daily masterclass. We got a lot going on over here. It is all called Work On Your Game. My name is Dre Baldwin, also known as Dre All Day, and welcome to the show. And today's topic is mastering the subject line. Now, what does that mean? I'll explain it. I'll explain this metaphor, what it means, and I'm explaining to you how to use it, even if you never thought about this before in today's episode. Before I get started, let me tell everybody, I send out a daily motivation text every single morning that I think you might want to receive. If you want to receive that daily motivation text, all you got to do is send me a quick text at my number. My number is 305-384-6894. Once you text me there, we'll confirm you. You'll get that daily motivation every day, and you can engage with me right there. You can you can reply to those texts, ask a question, share a challenge or something like that, or a win. You can tell me your, your wins and successes, great insights you've been getting from the show and from my books, and I will reply to you. I spend time every day doing that. The number again is 305-384-6894. Listed down below in the show notes. Now, today's topic is about mastering the subject line. Now, let me tell you what I mean by this. I personally, I send out a lot of emails between you know, everything that happens at Work On Your Game, a lot of emails get sent out every day. As a matter of fact, I'm recording this in the middle of, it's the middle of the month right now, and I just checked, we have sent over uh, 200,000 emails out so far this month, only 15 days into the month, 200,000 emails sent. And if you're on my email list, you know I'm sending you email. You're probably getting an email from me like every day, five to seven days a week. You're getting emails from me. I send them all the time, and hopefully they're good emails, and hopefully you're reading them. And actually, I know they're good because my job is to get you to read them so that you'll know how good they are. So I know the emails are good if you're actually reading them. But if you're not reading them, it's not actually it's actually not your fault unless you put the wrong email address in. If you mistyped your email address, then I can't. Then that, that is your fault. But if but we'll help and fix it. Just let me know. But if you typed in the right email address and you are not reading them, that means I'm making a mistake and it's not inside of the email. It's not the content that's messed up. It's the subject line because the subject line is the first thing that tells you whether or lets you decide whether or not you're actually going to read the email. Like y'all, Everybody here knows how email works, right? I once got this uh, comment, I think it was on YouTube, from a, a kid. I guess he was pretty young. He said, well, Dre, what's the way that I can get in touch with you? Because emails for old people, LOL. Now, I'm going to assume most of you uh, don't see email as for quote unquote old people, whatever that means. I don't know if I'm old, but I know a lot of you have email addresses because to get my books, you had to get the email address and my email list is growing a lot. That's how we're able to send 200,000 emails in 15 days. But the point is, since most of you know what email is, we all know what the subject line is, right? The subject line is the introduction, letting you know what is or at least giving you an idea of what's inside that email. And if the subject line is not enticing, you're not going to open the email. So that's the metaphor for today's show is you mastering that subject line so that your email, again, this is a metaphor, so that your email can get open. You, people need to see, you need to entice people with the way that you introduce yourself so that they can look into you and then they can get the substance. People can't even get to your substance if they don't even open, they don't even open your opening, if you understand what I'm saying. But you will understand it fully as we get into this. So let's get to it. Point number one. Topic once again is mastering the subject line in life. 96%, this is the first point. 96% of the sus 90 96% of the success of an email is in the subject line. 96%. The rest of it is the other 4% is what's inside the email. But if nobody opens the email, again, they'll never know what's inside of it. You might have the greatest. You may have the greatest prose, the greatest written article in history, the greatest sales letter ever written inside of your email. But if your subject line sucks, nobody will ever know how great your sales letter was. The headline or title that people see before they open it or if they open it is 96% of your success. And if you are not moved to action by the subject line of one of the emails that Dre Baldwin sends you, 
you'll never know all about all the brilliance that is inside of that email. And there is brilliance inside of it, but if my subject line does not move you to action, then you'll never open it. You'll never know about the offer inside. I might be giving you the best offer I could possibly create, but if you don't open the email, how will you even know that I gave you an offer? When you click on it, you won't even ever click on the link. You won't know what's on that web page over there. You won't know about the book that I'm trying to give you. You won't know about the funny joke. You won't see the picture. You won't see the gift. You won't get the story. None of that unless you open the email. So the subject line is doing all the work. 96% of the job is the subject line. The subject line, everybody, remember that this is metaphorically speaking. So even if you don't send emails, understand I'm still talking to you. Your subject line, the way that you introduce yourself to other people, the way you introduce yourself to the world, people's first impression of you, the first thing that people see or think or feel when they come across you, that is your metaphorical subject line. That subject line opens the door to everything else that I or you has to offer and want to share with everybody else. Now, everybody understand that? If I want to sell you something, let's say I had a new product. Let's say when, you know, like when this book, The Third Day, came out, then I'm, if you're watching on video, I'm holding this. When this book came out, I let everybody who was on my email list know about the book. Now, I've actually let you know about it many times because this book has been out for a couple months now, but I'm still letting you know about it. I still share things about it. I still send you, I will send you an email and, and show you, hey, here's what somebody said about the book. Here's a review that I got about the book. Here's uh, some comment that somebody made on Instagram about the book that they've read already. Here's something that I saw on somebody left a review on Amazon about the book. Somebody told me that they listened to the audio book. Anything that I get where people are telling me some value that they got from the book, I may be reaching out to you and telling you about it, but you won't know that I'm telling you that unless you open an email. And the only reason that you open an email is because the subject line drew your attention. This is the way that it works. All right, so everybody understand the concept of the subject line and why it matters. Now let's get into why it matters to you, even if you are not one who is out sending emails for any reason. Point number two, today's topic, once again, is mastering the subject line in life. The reason why I'm telling you this is because the email subject line is a metaphor for every single thing that you do in life. I already said this three times already. When I was in college, I had to, in order to receive a, a business degree, from Penn State University, every student who's in the business major must complete a, an internship. And it was like, uh, I think, because a normal class in college was worth, at least at that time, you got three credits for normal classes. The internship was worth like nine or 12 credits. I don't remember which one, usually nine credits or 12 credits. So that semester when you're doing your internship, theoretically, the way that it goes is that you don't even take that many classes because you had, to be, you had to be taking 12 credit hours to be a full-time student at Penn State at the time. So my internship was already either nine or 12 credits. So that could be your whole, that could be your whole course load is just the internship if it's 12 credits, and then you might take one or two other classes with it at the same time. So when I was taking that internship, when I was doing my internship, or at least before I did it, as a matter of fact, before you do your internship, you had to sign up for this internship preparatory class. Now, this preparatory class only met, I believe, once a week. It was either once a week or once every two weeks. Might have even been once a month. I don't remember. But the woman who coordinated the internships at Penn State Altoona at the time, her name was Mrs. Wood. This is a one-credit class that you had to take everybody who was about to take an internship. So it would be a bunch of us in there, like 30, 40 of us in there. And our, the business major wasn't that large, so we all knew each other. It was all the same people in all the classes, the business classes. And in that class, Mrs. Wood decided as a, that as a service to the students, she would have us do this um, job interview, a mock job interview, that we all would come in and her and some colleague that she knew from the area, I guess a local business guy, whatever, they would be sitting in the room and they would be like job interviewers. And then each one of us would schedule a time and we would go in as if we were in prospective employees trying to get hired for their company. And Mrs. Wood told us, she kind of trained us on the type of things that we could or should do to get ready for a job interview in real life. Like, all right, make sure that you make sure that you do some research on the company, do some research on the people who are going to be interviewing you. Of course, they're going to ask you questions, so be prepared to answer the questions. Like, they might ask you, "What's your biggest weakness?" or "What's your what's the one thing is your strength?" What would one of your former classmates or colleagues or college professors say about you? But also, she said things like you prepare some questions for them too. Don't just let them interview you, but you interview them as well. Ask them some questions so that they know that you have actually put some time into thinking about this job and that you actually care about it because you actually spent some time looking into them and seeing who they are and all that. And one of the things that she talked about in the pre preparation for the mock job interview 
was this thing called the Rules of 12. Now, I never heard of the Rules of 12. And the Rules of 12 were very simple. She said, when you walk into a room for anything, and specifically she was talking about a job interview, but this applies to anything, actually, that people notice three things. The 12 inches from the floor up your, uh, up your pants leg, meaning your shoes, how clean your shoes are, your, your socks, your pants cuffs, or ladies, your legs, if your legs are exposed. The second 12 that they notice is the 12 inches from the top of your head down to, let's just say, about your, your collarbone. So how your hair is set, if you have something on your head, you know, if your face is presentable, if you don't, make sure there's no food stuck in your teeth, if you got your makeup on properly, if you have a smile on your face, if your collar is clean, depending on what kind of, what kind of shirt you have on, is your shirt, um, yeah, is your suit clean, do you have a tie on, does it match? Those things from the top of your head down to 12 inches to about your collar. And the first 12 seconds of the engagement, meaning when you first walk in, your eye contact, the way that you walk, your handshake, your energy, all of those things. Those are the three 12s. So it's from the bottom of the floor, from the top of your head, and the first 12 seconds of engagement. Those are the rules of 12. And that's something that I've always remembered all these years from that internship class. And even though I didn't really learn anything during my internship, rest in peace to Phil Sky out there in Altoona, PA. He was the person who was my... Uh, he's the person who hired me actually for my internship and I didn't really learn anything else in that internship course I did remember that so I guess that was worth my four years of education at Penn State University but anyway the point is those rules of 12 is your that is your subject line that's your something when people first come across you any of you who makes this video any of you who's watching this on video this is on YouTube and I remember back in the days when YouTube, let's say between around maybe 2008 to around 2012, YouTube used to share, and they still do this. I just don't pay, I don't pay attention to it, but they used to put out like, hey, here are some best practices for YouTube. Here are some things you can do to you know, make sure your videos are going the right way. It, sometimes YouTube would create it themselves, but other times it'd be other people who would say, here are some things to do on YouTube. And one of the things that YouTube would always talk about was like the first five seconds of the video are really important. And whether you want to put a teaser of what the video is going to be about, whether if you want to put your branding, whatever is going to be like here in my videos, you get the Dre all day dot com. But that thing, that actual clip is like less than two seconds long. And that first five seconds of your video, they say that has a big impact on how much of the video people actually watch. And that is very true. Any of you who makes videos on YouTube, you know that the first minute or so of your video usually has a much higher watch time than the rest of the video. No matter how great your video is, there's always going to be a drop off the longer the video goes because most people do not stick with things through the end. And that's a that's another good metaphor right there for life that I wasn't even planning right there. But that is 100 percent true. Most people don't stick through to the end of anything. They come from the beginning for the exciting part. And then when it's not exciting anymore, they pretty much fall off and go away. This is all part of the rules of 12. And the rules of 12 are part of, again, your subject line in life. And this is, you could even take the YouTube, let's say the first 12 seconds. And you could take your emails. If someone does open your email, it doesn't mean they're going to read the whole thing, right? Because the first 12 words, the first paragraph might determine if they read the second and the third and the fourth paragraph. The same thing when you are out in the world dating. The first 12 minutes of that date might determine, you probably have already decided. I would think, any of you, any of you who's, Everybody here has been in the dating world, probably on some level. In the first 12 minutes of that engagement with that person, if the answer is no, and you know you're not going to deal with this person anymore, you already know it in the first 12 minutes. Is this true or not? But you might be polite enough to just stick around for the rest of the, the meal so you can finish eating or you know, find out whatever you're going to find out from this person. But you've already decided if this is a yes or a no, usually in the first 12 minutes. You... If you're going to give them more of a chance in the first 12 minutes, you know that you're going to. And if it's a hell no, then you know that it's a hell no in the first 12 minutes. So that rules of 12 matters a lot and it applies to pretty much everything. So this is a metaphor for everything that you do in life. People decide about you very quickly. Us human beings, we make decisions instinctively. We make these snap judgments about people all the time in a very short period of time. Now, we might not let people know we made that decision so quickly, but we have made it in our minds. And then we use the rest of the time after the first 12 seconds or the first 12 minutes, whatever it's going to be. We use the rest of the time to just come up with logical justifications for the decision that our instincts have already made. That's what we do. We all do this all the time. We make a decision. We're going to buy something or not. And then we spend the next 
hour coming up with logical justifications for the decision that we already made. And we all do this, and some people do this for their whole lives. They make a decision in 10 seconds, so the next 10 years coming up with justifications for it. I was watching this Floyd Mayweather documentary on YouTube. This, this documentary was like three hours long. It took me like two weeks to watch it because I watched a little bit when I was like brushing my teeth or something like that, then watch a little bit more and a little bit more. And I finally got through the whole thing. And there was a period, any of you who's a, a boxing fan and you really watch boxing deeply, I'm not a deep boxing fan, I'm a casual fan, but I know about Floyd Mayweather, but I didn't really start paying really that much attention to him probably until like the later half of his career. But at the beginning of his career, Floyd was, it was clear that he was a very good boxer and he was, you know, beating good fighters. And I mean, he never lost a fight. So he was beating a lot of good fighters, even in the early parts of his career. But when he first came out, he was, they called him pretty boy Floyd because he had this baby face and he was a really good fighter. He came from a lineage of fighters. His uncle was a fighter. His dad was a fighter. And he was calling himself pretty boy and he was beating people and moving up, but he didn't feel like he was getting his just due. He didn't feel like he was getting the kind of, he was beating all the fighters that he was going against. And then some fighters were kind of staying away from him because they didn't want to maybe get beat by him. But at the same time, Floyd didn't feel like he was making the kind of money that he wanted to make as a boxer. And he felt like his promoter was not putting enough effort into making Floyd more of a household name, that he was promoting other people and not giving Floyd his, not giving enough attention to Floyd, thusly not helping Floyd make enough money. And Floyd had an issue with this. So eventually, while he was still you know, doing his thing and beating people, Floyd eventually separated from his promoter and he started his own promotions company. So I'm gonna be my own promoter, I'm gonna promote myself, and, and I'm gonna make more money at the same time because this whole thing was, listen, I'm a prize fighter and the best fighter gets the prize, I am the best fighter out here. I'm beating everybody. I should be getting the biggest prize. But he wasn't getting the biggest prize, so he had an issue with that. So Floyd, when he started promoting himself, he stopped calling himself Pretty Boy. He changed from Pretty Boy Floyd to Money Mayweather, which everybody knows him as this now. Money Mayweather, to where he would start you know, flaunting his money and talking about his lifestyle and showing off his cars and his homes and the way he lived. And he had a, a style that some people would probably call flashy and cocky and arrogant. And this caused, this is what happened when Floyd started doing that. First of all, it caused people who didn't, it caused people to, some people to not like him because they liked him before when he was pretty boy. Like, oh yeah, he's, he's pretty, he's a little guy. He has his baby face, he looks young and he's beating people in boxing. He's a good boxer. Everybody respected it. There was, Floyd wasn't very polarizing. It wasn't really a much polarized opinion about him. And for the most part, you had to be somewhat of a boxing fan to even know who he was. But when he became Money Mayweather, something interesting happened. Now, people who didn't even pay attention to boxing like that start noticing this guy because he started, again, making a spectacle of himself in ways that had nothing to do with his actual boxing abilities. He was showing off his money and his cars and his lifestyle. And those are things that everybody has an opinion on, or at least they want it on some level, or at least make you pay attention to it if someone is flaunting it, regardless of how they got it. So he started to draw in this audience of people who weren't even boxing fans. But this is all part of his strategy because this, if you get casual fans to pay attention to your thing, even though they're not so much into the thing, this is when more money starts to come in. And this works in every industry. And I'm going to give you another example in a second. And another thing that happened is Floyd started polarizing people because he was being this flashy guy. And he was doing all this on purpose. This is not something out of his control. He knew that showing off his wealth and showing off his, his lifestyle and all that stuff was going to make some people envious of him. It would make some people say he's doing too much, make some people say, well, he's arrogant and cocky, showing off all this stuff that he has. He knew it would polarize people and the people would start watching his fights. He even said this in his own words. People watch my fights to see me lose. But that's cool because every time they watch my fight to see me lose, as long as it's on pay-per-view, I'm making more money. So this whole thing was a big grand strategy by Floyd to make himself more money by working the rules of 12. Instead of getting you to pay attention to the substance, like we talked about in yesterday's episode, instead of getting you to pay attention to the substance of how solid of a boxer he was technically, which he was and was throughout his career, instead, let me get you to pay attention to this surface level candy, this this short-term thing, this thing that a casual person will notice even though you don't give a damn about boxing, let me get you to pay attention to that because you'll come buy my pay-per-view boxing match just because you want to see this cocky guy lose. And it worked. And Floyd became you know, the highest paid boxer of all time. He was the top earning athlete many years during the last half of his career simply because he drew so much attention even from people who were not hardcore boxing fans. And all of you know who he is even though you, most of you are not hardcore boxing fans because he got you to pay attention. And that was part of working the rules of 12. 
give you another example. Jay-Z, a rapper who I mentioned, I did a virtual mentors episode on him. Let me tell you what episode that was. That was episode number 281, Virtual Mentors Part 2, Sean Jay-Z Carter. When he first came out rapping, Jay-Z was known to rap fans. If you are a rap fan and you listen to rap music, you knew about Jay-Z. You had your opinion. Most people thought he was pretty good. His first album was critically acclaimed, even though he didn't sell a ton of records. His second album did a little bit better. He was still critically acclaimed as, all right, this guy's a pretty good rapper. He's good. But there were other rappers that other people might say were better. The reason that Jay-Z took off, when he really started to take off and he became more of a household name, to the point that those of you who are not rap music fans actually start to know who he was, wasn't until his third album. And at the time of his third album, what Jay-Z did, he and his business partner, a guy by the name of Dame Dash, who I also talked about in episode number, that was Virtual Mentors number four, episode number 488. Dame Dash was his manager. He was kind of the visionary for what they can do with Jay-Z. And he said, what we need to do is we need, because Jay-Z was a, a guy who came from the streets. He rapped about the streets. He rapped about being a drug dealer and coming from the projects and the ghetto and things like that. And that was fine. There, were, there was a certain demographic of people who could identify with his story and identify with the, his subject matter, and they would listen to it. People like me and maybe people like you. But there are a whole bunch of other people, being that you know, the type of stuff that Jay-Z was talking about was it could be understood by maybe 10% of the population. But what Jay-Z wanted to reach, and this was his vision from the very beginning, and Dame Dash said this explicitly back in the 90s, was we need to get Jay-Z's message heard by these white suburban kids who don't know anything about the streets. They have never dealt a drug. Maybe they maybe take some drugs, but they, they're not drug dealers. They're not hustlers. They are not from the ghetto. They have never been to the projects and never will be. They're not from the hood and never will go there. But they go to school. They go home. They watch MTV. We need those people to know who Jay-Z is. When we get them to notice us, that's when we'll be where we need to be. And on his third album, it's called Hard Not Light, Volume 2. That was, that's my favorite Jay-Z album to this very day because of the, the, the quantum jump that Jay-Z made on that album. That album is what got the casual fan to start noticing Jay-Z. In other words, Jay-Z, just like Floyd Mayweather, they both changed the subject line of their approach. Y'all following what I'm saying here? When they changed the subject line of their approach, all of a sudden, a whole bunch more people started noticing. They didn't actually get any better. I mean, they were good to begin with, but when their subject line changed, all of a sudden, the audience changed. All of a sudden, more people started paying attention. I'll give you one more example. When I was trying to get into pro basketball, or even once I was already in, but then I found myself out and I was trying to get back in again, the most important thing for me to get in or back in was not necessarily my game. Now, did I need to have game? Yes. Did Floyd need to be good at boxing? Yeah, because if he had lost the fight, then he wouldn't have continued to uh, ascend in the sport. Did Jay-Z need to be good at rapping and making songs? Yes, because if he got all this attention but his song was whack, then the fans wouldn't stick around. So, yes, did I need to be able to make an open jump shot and finish at the rim and play defense and rebound when I was playing ball? Of course. But were there other people who had those abilities, too, who weren't able to get on or stay on? Yes, there were. What separated me in my career and the reason why I was able to make it happen and i would use this still to this very day in the business world is my ability to sell myself and selling myself is about the rules of 12 because you want to sell somebody first you got to get their attention and what if how actually let me back up how can you sell yourself when there are a hundred other people or a thousand other people who claim to have similar skills to you also trying to sell themselves to the exact same person that you're trying to sell yourself to. There's a hundred different people trying to sell the same product to one person. How does that one person choose who to pay attention to? That's by utilizing the rules of 12. It's by utilizing the subject line. Sometimes for me, literally the subject line, getting my emails open, getting people to pay attention to what I'm saying. Making the right connection. And let me back up. In the business world, I still do this to this day. In order for me to get on stage to do TED Talks, in order for me to land a keynote speaking gigs, for me to appear on other people's platforms and get interviewed, for me to get book publishing deals, for me to sell my products and services, it's really about me mastering the subject line. Yes, I need to be good once you start paying attention, but if you never pay attention in the first place, does it matter that I'm good? The answer is, unfortunately, no. And many people just suck at the subject line and this is why they're good, but nobody knows who the hell you are. 
and you're not getting your goods into the hands of the people who need it because you have not mastered selling yourself. And I talked about selling yourself in many episodes of this show. I got a whole selling yourself uh, masterclass series that is inside of Work On Your Game University. If you go to the self-directed learning, you get lifetime access to everything in there, again, at workonyourgameuniversity.com. Now, after you sell yourself, after you get the rules of 12 to work, and now people have bought into you, at least to pay attention to you, now your substance, your skill, your game, that becomes important. But your game is secondary if you can't sell yourself. But your game is secondary until you sell yourself. Actually, that's a better way of saying it. It's not the other way around. Many people are going through life thinking, well, because they have game, that they'll be able to sell themselves. Well, no, you sell yourself, then you let people know that you have game. But until you've sold yourself, then your game does not matter because nobody has, nobody's gotten deep enough to even notice. Making the right connections in life. Many people ask me about connections and networking and knowing the right people and building relationships. A good place to do that, as a matter of fact, will be in the group coaching programs at Work On Your Game University. Again, that link is down below, Work On Your Game University. You want to connect with the type of people that can help you elevate your business and show you how to take what you already have resources-wise, time, money, attention, energy, focus, and make the most of it. That is in Work On Your Game University. But many people, when it comes to building relationships, think that their substance or their needs are what builds relationships. That is absolutely false. Making the right connections is more about you being in the places where those people are at, where you can get the rules of 12 to actually work in your favor than it is about you being your perfect self because you could be whoever you are and have your needs and hopefully there are people out there who can fill them and there's somebody out there who can do anything. But if you're not in the places where those people are at, then how will you ever be known by them? This is why I tell you to be in the room. This is why I tell you when I have a live event, like working your game live, be in the room at the event because that's where the connections get made, in the room, not on Facebook, not on Instagram, not in the DM. You got to be in the room where these people are actually at. That's the rules of 12. Just because you're in the room, you might not even be the best person for them to connect with. But if there's only 20 people in the room, the 10 million people who are not in the room, they can't make the same kind of connection that you're capable of making simply because you're standing right there shaking their hand. Whereas everybody else is on the internet hoping to get seen through a DM. It's a whole different level. This is why the approach matters. Many people think incorrectly that having skills and abilities affords you opportunity. That is false. And some people might even get that idea from looking at me and seeing I'm the guy saying work on your game. Well, what a lot of people don't understand is part of your game is selling yourself. And if you have a ton of game, but you can't sell yourself, then your game does not matter. As I just said, after you sell yourself, then your skill and ability can be paid attention to. But if you can't sell yourself, then your skill and ability goes unnoticed because you don't master the subject line. Point number three. Today's topic, once again, is mastering the subject line of life. Number three, do not discount, despite everything I just said, do not discount the value of game. Game matters after you're in the room. When you're in the room, your substance matters because now people are paying attention to you in detail. Now they're evaluating you. Now they're really listening to what you're saying. Now they want to know, all right, uh, what is this person actually saying now that, now that I'm noticing them? But if you can't get in the room, in other words, if your subject line sucks, if you fail with the rules of 12, or you just can't sell yourself, period, then your game doesn't matter because people don't even know, they don't even know about you, let alone do they know about your game. When you put emphasis, when you need to, let me say it a different way, you need to put as much emphasis on marketing and selling yourself as you put into the substance and skill and value that you bring to the table. Let me say that one, one more time because I want to make sure you heard what I just said. You need to put as much emphasis into marketing and selling yourself as you put into developing your skill and your game and making sure that you give people value. Because if you can't sell yourself and market yourself and promote yourself, nobody will ever care that you have game and value. In episode 1515, I told you, you are a marketer. If you have not listened to that episode, please go listen to that episode for your sake, for the sake of the success of your business out here in this world. You gotta go listen to that episode. Episode 1835, I gave you three marketing traffic strategies and how to use each one. In episode 1897, I told you that marketing is a lifetime job. Don't discount the value of game, but marketing is what allows your game to matter. Personally, I'm always looking at and thinking of better ways to sell myself. Like how can I get my value in, in front of the people who actually would value it and will exchange their value for my value? In other words, I can sell them something that they want at a price that makes sense to them and they're going to get 10 times the ROI for whatever they invest. Where are those people at? I want to find them. I'm always looking for those individuals. 
I see people who, sometimes I see people who I don't believe have the same value or substance that I have. They don't have my, they can't equal my game, but they might be using some type of tactic or idea for selling themselves that might be working. I might steal it. I might say, all right, well, this person has no substance, but they're doing this tactic and they're helping and it's helping themselves. So if I use the tactic, combine it with my substance, I'll do better than them. So I'll go steal that tactic and I'll go use it myself. Now, why would I steal from someone who doesn't have half my substance? Because their idea might help me get my substance discovered. I'm not stealing their substance, I'm stealing their tactic. But as long as I have a strategy for doing so, that'll work. And I gave you the three-step process to doing that in an episode where I told you that it, it, you start with the overall mindset, then you go into the strategy, and then you go to the tactics. That's the three-step process for fulfilling yourself in that framework of achievement. That was episode 1921. And also the fulfillment triad is episode 1913. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, but you got to be willing to take a look. Let's recap today's class, which is mastering the subject line in your life. If you ever send an email or receive an email, you know the subject line is the first thing that you see. And if the subject line does not move you to action, then you won't even see what's inside the email. That's why this matters. It's a metaphor. Number one, point number one, 96% of success of an email is in the subject line, right? That's the headline or the title. If someone doesn't open this sub, the email based on the subject line, they will never see what's inside. They'll never see the offer. They'll never click the link. Never pass go, never collect $200. If you ever sent an email, you understand this. Now, why does this matter? Point number two, because the email subject line is a metaphor for all of your life. As my, one of my college professors said, the rules of 12. You got 12 seconds pretty much to get somebody's attention, maybe less. These days, probably not even that much. Floyd Mayweather, he was pretty boy, but as soon as he became money and started showing off things that casual, that non-serious boxing fans would notice that would pay attention to his money went way up he was already he already sold himself to the serious boxing fans he needed to sell himself to everybody else jay-z has sold himself to the people who understood the streets and or at least his his stories of drug life and the ghetto and the projects and when he started saying things that people who had never been in those environments and knew nothing about them when he started saying things that they understood that's when he went from being a rap star to being a superstar me being a pro basketball player, I was a good player. I had skill, I had pro level ability, but so did a thousand other players, but not all of those thousand never got a chance to play pro. The reason I was able to get on is I was able to sell myself. I knew how to sell myself and talk about myself in such a way that I could get somebody's attention who had the power to actually do something to move my career forward. That's the reason why I was able to make it, in addition to the fact that I could actually play. Many people incorrectly think that having skills and ability affords you opportunity. That is false. Having skills and ability is required, but if you can't sell, then you will never get opportunity. Point number three, do not discount the value of game. Game matters a whole lot after you are in the room. But if you can't get in the room, in other words, your subject lines suck, which means in plain English that you suck at selling, then your game does not matter because nobody knows that you have it. So me, I'm always looking at ways to get better at marketing and selling and promoting myself. Remember that marketing, selling, promoting yourself is a lifetime job. You are never retired from marketing, selling, and promoting yourself. You can stop creating new things to sell. You can just take one thing and just sell it for the rest of your life. As long as you get good at marketing, selling, and promoting that thing, you don't have to keep creating new stuff. You just got to get good at getting it out there and getting it in front of the people who actually matter, i.e. the people who are willing and able to buy it. All this said, you want to receive my daily motivation text that will keep you fresh, sharp, focused, on point every morning, send me a text at 305-384-6894. You ready to join the university, get coached by me, group coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching. We also got self-directed learning in there. Go to workonyourgameuniversity.com. Work on your game. Dre all day.